uh, something that's very near and dear to my heart, and that is testing. And I uh, just want to you know, spend a bit of time going over what testing means. And this series on testing, this particular session, is about code level testing. So we do have our automation suite running under robot, um, which is more end-to-end -end or integration testing. Uh, this is going a little bit lower, deeper into the code. And it is uh, to use a phrase from uh, some agile methodologies and agile training that I've been through. This is how you drive quality deep into the heart of your code. I want to start with a little bit of a digression into legacy code. Many people may have heard the term legacy code before. What is legacy code? Well, it's spaghetti code. It's code that's poorly structured. It's not documented. Or where it is, the comments are wrong, misleading. Or perhaps even the comments are, you know, set variable x to 5. And the next line is, let x equal 5. Not necessarily useful comments. Legacy code could be somebody else's code that you now have that you've got to figure out and you've got to maintain. But ultimately, legacy code is code that doesn't have any tests to go with it. Because the code will be unknowable in a week's time and you won't know what it's supposed to do if there's no test to go with it. So if you, make a if you make a change to that code, you don't know if you've made it better or not. Code that's written without tests today is tomorrow's legacy code. So with tests in place, we can change the code quickly. We can verify that we didn't break anything. Without the code chain, without the tests in place, we don't know if our code is any better or if we just made it worse. This is from a book that I absolutely love called Working Effectively with Legacy Code. Great read, um, worth it if you can uh, grab a copy of it and have a look through it. So, talking about unit tests. Well, what is a unit test? There's many different opinions on this. Is this something that tests your code at the method level? Or does it go down to each if clause level? Is it test success path, failure path only? Is it automated? Or do I have to manually set up an environment like, okay, well, I need to have an Oracle database and I need to have the following tables in place and I need to have some data in those tables for this test to run. Do I need a special environment for it to run? Um, some, I mentioned the database. Maybe there's something else. Maybe there's a web server that's needed or web socket interface or some sort of uh, remote procedure call. Maybe I have to have um, special software around in order to be able to run the test. So when I'm talking about having unit tests and when we talk about having these tests in OSM, if our meaning isn't clear, if we're not all talking about the same thing, then we have to ask the question, do we all know what we're doing? Do we, do we have a common understanding? And when I say, oh, you need to write tests for that, did you, are, are, are you able to meet my expectation if I say, we forgot a test? You may look at it and go, but I did write a test. <laughs> so do we know what to do? So there was a term that was brought out, which is called microtest. And for the purpose of code level testing and the things that happen in the stage two Jenkins job, we're calling, I, I, I've borrowed the term microtests. 
and this is not something that I invented. Um, arguably, a microtest is just another name for unit test, but it is one that's loaded with a specific meaning. And that meaning is the test itself is short. It's just a few lines of code if possible. It's always automated. What I mean by automated is you don't have to go out of your way to invoke a command in order for it to run. Jenkins will do this automatically. It's also automated in such a way that no manual configuration is required in order for this to happen. It is part of a purpose-built test application. In the case of Python, or in the case of OSM, we have specific uh, source code, which is the unit test source code. And each one of these follows the test application framework from Python. A micro test should test a single branch of logic. If there's an if statement, you should have two tests one for the if, the other for the else. Arguably, one test should assert one fact only. If there's multiple things to uh, determine whether it was successful or successful or not, it could be argued that you should have multiple tests then. That way, if a test fails, it fails for one and only one reason. If we have a test that um, tests five different things and only one of them fails, well, the whole thing fails and it's up to you know the, the person looking at the code and looking at the test to figure out which one of the five failed. Test code should be written to the same standard as regular code. We don't want um, you know, lots of uh, duplicated code. We don't want spaghetti code in our unit tests. We want um, proper PEP8 compliance and static linters to be able to run against our test code. The test code should be kept in Git as well. It should serve as a gateway to commit. And in the case of OSM, it does. If a test fails, Jenkins will vote minus one and we won't be able to get through. Tests also need to be very quick. We're talking in the order of milliseconds per test. I should be able to have a suite of a thousand tests that could run in a, a second or so. Mention this uh, when I talk about the single branch of logic provide precise feedback on errors. So that way, if something fails, if a test fails, I don't have to go hunting to figure out why. It doesn't just say, oh, fail, but it produces a message saying, failed because I was expecting X to be equal to two, not three. Microtests are part of a collection. Um, when I run talks-e cover in OSM, the entire suite of tests run as one single collection. I don't have to invoke it a thousand times to execute a thousand tests. Tests should be easy to invoke. They can be gray box. What I mean by that is we can manipulate the contents inside the environment as the test is happening. We need to be able to test impossible conditions, which means we need to be able to change the environment in such a way as to make that impossible condition happen. Microtests also need to avoid the use of collaborators. What is a collaborator? It's another object that you need to talk to. For example, a database is, um, you know, it's an external entity and the library that you use inside of Python to it, communicate with the database is a collaborating object. So when I go, okay, um, you know, I need to fetch, uh, execute an SQL query against a database. 
Well, it shouldn't use the real database object for that. It should use a mock object, and I'll get into what mocks are a little bit later. Tests also should involve the creation of very few objects. We shouldn't have these huge complicated tests um, that need to do a, a thousand things just before executing one line of code. Uh, the reason being um, is that if that's the case, then that is what we call a code smell. It means that the function that you're about to test is probably too big and it should be broken down. That's not something that we can always do. Sometimes that's just the way life is, but still we should have very few objects in our test. And it should also not require any external software. I shouldn't have to install a database in order for my test to run. So how to write tests? Well, what do I need to test? We need to make sure that we test the expected behavior and the logic paths, any external API or you know, the, the method signature of a function. We need to test exceptions including impossible conditions. Um, database corrupted is what you would consider an impossible condition. Well, how on earth am I going to corrupt a database and make sure that I can test my software to handle that? Well, you need to. We need to be able to write a test to make sure that your handling of exceptions that are nearly impossible to create are still tested. What don't you need to test? Well, things that are too simple to break or what we call getters and setters. You know, let A equal one. Well, do I really need to test that A was equal to one afterwards? Sometimes I've actually seen bugs in that type of code where, you know, a couple values were passed in and the wrong value was being set. <laughs> So when have you tested enough? When fear of things breaking turns into boredom of testing. Tests can also serve as documentation. See, a good test demonstrates what the function of the method being called is. It helps you understand the expected inputs and the expected outputs. It helps you understand what exception handling is happening or what exceptions you can expect to come out of the method. Tests the interaction or demonstrates the interactions with other objects. When I take a look at a test and I see, oh, it needs a database. It's, it's, it's mocking up a database. Obviously, I now know that this function is going to need a database. Tests can serve as an example of how to use the API. How do I, you know, how do I use this function? What sort of exceptions can happen? What inputs and outputs can I expect from it? Tests must also be indepotent and independent. Indepotent means that it is not going to change anything in the environment irrevocably or in such a way that if I run this test, 10 times in a row, the second time it's going to fail because the first time left something behind. Tests should never leave anything behind. Tests must be self-contained and repeatable. So I should be able to run the same test any number of times in a row and expect the exact same results each time. Tests have to have everything that they need to be able to cover all the logic paths that they're testing. A test must not cause changes in the environment, should not write files to a file system, should not delete files, shouldn't update rows in a database, etc. They also can't leave anything behind because that could you know, ruin the environment for, for other tests. Tests must not depend upon a prior test. So if I have a test that inserts a row into the database, 
my second test that checks to see if a row is in the database should not rely on the first test being there, leaving that row behind. And tests should not have any side effects. Specifically, tests must not launch rockets into outer space. <laughs> but, but the function that I'm working on launches a rocket. What do I do? How can we test a rocket without actually sending it into orbit? The answer, mock it. It's not a rocket, you're going to mock it. Well, what exactly is a mock? In uh, Python, mocks are annotations. They're a specific um, object that gets created that allows you to be in control of what it does. This is what it looks like inside of a uh, inside of a Python unit test itself. So here is a test that's been defined: test collect Noki non-rate instance. And we can see that we're mocking the build neutron client and build Noki client of the Noki backend object. So what is a mock? It's a simulated object that can mimic the behavior of the real object in very controlled ways. You use mocks if the object that needs to uh, that you're that that you're collaborating with like uh, like that Noki client that we were talking about, um, if it has non-deterministic results. Like for example, if I'm taking a look at the um, elapsed time and I need to exit, exit my function if more than five seconds have, has elapsed, well, I don't want to use the current time for that because that's going to require uh, five seconds for the test to finish. So I'll want to mock out the current time and control the values that it returns. First time, it's going to return, you know, 12.05 in the afternoon in zero seconds. The second time current time is called, it's going to call return, you know, 12.05 and six seconds. So now the function can exit immediately because when it compares the original time to the current time, it'll see five seconds have elapsed. If the object has a state that is difficult to create or reproduce, such as a net network error, you don't want to actually try and connect to a non-existent server in order to test, you know, connection failed, um, because that could take a long time to time out. And by accident, the server might actually exist or respond, and all of a sudden your test isn't working. You also want to use a mock if the object is slow, like a database. You don't want to initialize the database or do any sort of setup like that um, because that takes a long time and, and it's not deterministic. So what can a mock do? It only does what it's told to do. It doesn't do anything more. So by default, if I create a mock object and I call any function on that mock object, I'm going to get a return value of true. Nothing will happen. It'll just come back and say, okay, it's done. Now, how does that work for um, testing? Well, I can say, you know, the side effect of calling this mock is you're going to return one, two, three, or you're going to return, you know, 1205 in the afternoon. It can also throw exceptions. I can say, Oh, mock database dot, you know, when, when, when you call um, fetch a current row, throw a new database index corrupted exception. So then when you call fetch current row, all of a sudden you're getting a corrupted database exception. Or when I call rocket dot launch, I can say, yes, the rocket is launched and here's your rocket object. Or I can say, no, it failed. So no logic path or exception should go without testing. You can test anything in this way. So the proof of this, yes, it's already part of our pipeline. 
Both pre- and post-merge commits contain this. We have a test result trend in Jenkins that you can see. And we have our code coverage. Shows what packages were tested, what, um, how many files were tested, as well as the percent of line coverage. So in this particular one here, you can see, you know, uh, 100 builds ago, we were only at 40% and it dropped for a bit and then it went up and then it dropped and up and up and eventually we ended up with 60% line coverage. Inside of Jenkins, I can actually go in and drill in and see, oh, there's going to be lines in green that say this line of code was executed and lines in this kind of pinky red that says this never had a test touch it. So when I say we only covered 60% of the code, I can go in and look. Anything that's in this pinky red means that it does not have a test. And anything that I do inside of that line, I can change it and do whatever I want, and no one will know the difference because nobody has tested it. We want to protect the code. Put, putting it all together and having lots of very fast micro tests. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be a very onerous thing to run a test suite. We should cover a predefined percentage of the code base. We currently do not, but we could enable it that Jenkins could fail the job. I realize I have a word missing here, or Jenkins could fail the job. In other words, if the code coverage drops too low, we could put in a policy that says Jenkins, is, Jenkins will vote minus one because you've introduced more code than tests and that's not good for our code base. It is a perfect companion to Garrett. It acts as the pre-review gate as part of stage two. And reviews will be rejected if a test is broken. As I mentioned, it could reject it if the percentage of code coverage drops. We don't have that in place right now, but it's something that I'm seriously considering implementing. <laughs> All this together prevents us from having legacy code. So what have we learned? Code without tests is tomorrow's legacy code. Micro tests are just really good unit tests. They're fast, they're repeatable, they're indepotent, and they're independent. Mocks replace any slow, dangerous, or difficult collaborators. And that there is no code that is too complex to test. We should never find ourselves in a position of saying, oh, man, this is so complicated, I can't write a test for it. Break it down. Talk with us. Um, we've all had experience in different ways of working with legacy code and breaking things down. Um, there's always a way to test it. Jenkins knows how to read the unit tests and the code coverage results and can vote on that. And by that, Gary can prevent patches that violate the norms set by the project. So this is how we operate in OSM and help to maintain the quality of our code. And that ends the theory part of today.